This house near Charing Cross in London is the only surviving home of Benjamin Franklin, one of the founding fathers of the United States of America. Peter, hello. It's a pleasure. To it seems like a good place to meet novelist Peter Carey to talk about his new book. So, Peter, welcome to the to the house once lived in by Benjamin Franklin. Well, I hope he. I see he's tidied up a little bit since he left. That's good. <laughs> well, I don't know. I thought since since the book's about the birth pangs of young America, this seemed like a nice place to oh, wonderful to meet up. Carey is Australian. His book is about Olivier, a noble escaping the French Revolution, his reluctant English servant Parrot, and what happens when they go to a newly founded United States of America. So, Peter, this is a book, it seems to me, about people wrenchingly dislocated across continents. And this is a theme that appears in more than one of your books, and I can't help asking... You're going to try and drag my life into this, aren't I, you? you are, I, I can see it happening. I, you can't, can't. I can't help it. You know, you're an Australian living in New York. Surely there must be some element of, of you know, personal fascination. Because I, well, I was thinking about this the other day, that in, in, in dealing with writing about Australia, um, uh, I think one always... Ends up, I have always ended up thinking about two countries. And I think yeah, it's the result of the colonial situation that you are inevitably thinking of yourself as a consequence of some other country's decision, in the case of Australia, Great Britain. And it's certainly true that in my own life, um, you know, I've lived in a lot of different places. I've got two American kids, you know, <laughs> who say, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> or something like it. I say, you mean awesome. No, no, <laughs> we mean awesome. Uh, I know it sounds bad in English, but never mind. Tell, tell us about the character. If you had to introduce the two characters in your book, Olivier mm. and Parrot. Oh. Well, I mean, the thing I love about Olivier, you know, I mean, his, his sort of splenetic, snobbish anxious sort of personality, which is so sort of full of... In, in, in one way, always people say, you must identify with Parrot. Parrot's really you. Well, I, there's, a, there's a whole lot of Olivier in me that I like to inhabit. Tell me about Parrot. Tell me about the other, the other man in this tale of two men. It's a sort of a perverse and terrible thing to say, I suppose, that he sort of, in a way, begins by being not Olivier. <laughs> His political take has to be in opposition to Olivier's. I mean, he's basically, he's a radicalised orphan who ends up in France, yes. falling in love, with, <laughs> falling in love with, a, with a painter. Yes. And rather reluctantly becoming Olivier's servant. Well, it, take, it takes him a little while to realise he's become a servant because his whole idea of himself is absolutely not a servant. As a child, I was short-sighted, but could always shoot a sparrow on the wing. I could not see it, but still I shot it dead. On the first occasion the Havre was becalmed, we came upon a floating barrel, and this soon became a shooting target. Of course, I won. And who would know me to be a citizen of myopia, whose lands are furred like watercolour washes, whose king is as smudgy as a dancing moth? The Americans didn't make things any calmer. They saw what it meant for the noble man to win, and so politely ensured him his victory. When, after an eternity, the barrel was splintered flotsam on the sea, he bought them all champagne to celebrate, while towards me, he played the icy master. Who would know me to be a citizen of myopia, whose lands are furred like watercolour washes? whose king is as smudgy as a dancing moth. I mean, that's just, you know, as a writer myself, that just annoys me, that's so good. I'm pleased you're annoyed, thank you. Do these phrases, these wonderful vivid phrases, just come to you, or do you sometimes think, well, I've got to get on with the book, and if I can make it more vivid later, I'll revisit that scene? I really, really want to, to be really vividly alive in the moment, and I want to be aware, and the reader to be aware of the constrictions of space or the expanse of space and all of the sort of vectors of force that affect the scene. And so I want to know how it smells and how... It... There's a lot of smells in the book. See, my father had no sense of smell. There's a lot of... I, I think it's... I'm forever compensating for that. 
This evening or the next, Mr. Godfroy is to take me to the town of Wethersfield, where I will attend a meeting of the citizens to elect their local officials. As this is in the state of Connecticut, I do wonder if they will sing their state song, of which I now provide for you, dear Comtesse, a small sample. Yankee Doodle went to town, a riding on a pony. He stuck a feather in his hat and called it macaroni. At this moment, I witnessed the arrival of Olivier de Garmont in the church. He wasn't higher than Godfrey's shoulder, but he seemed to give off a certain light. Doubtless, the blue jacket surrounded by so much black and gray, his white, bright, rough, but something else, a glowing skin, an elegance of manner, aristocratic, call it that. Baudelaire says that, you know, the, the writer's duty is to write about modern life, the painter's duty is to, is to tackle modern life, so why are you writing historical novels? I, I always think I'm writing about modern life. I wouldn't, wouldn't, I would not be interested in writing about the past for the sake of the past. But there's a pretty dark undertow to this book's description of America. Certainly, those of us who write, and many other thinking people start to look around and see that we are sort of seem to be swimming in a sea of cultural crap. I actually don't agree with you because I, I just I, I think there is a lot out there and there's always been a lot out there it's just that the, the, the technology we have now beams more of it at us. I see so much interesting art, so much interesting filmmaking, I read so much interesting writing. I, I, I would really, I don't disagree with you that the extraordinary things are being made. Uh, but I'm talking about a C. And, you know, within the, you know, there are these things f floating in the sea with all those islands of plastic and other things that are there. The energy put into this quest for wealth left little room for anything one might think of as culture. You're no better than Lord Pintle de Pantleby, Watkins, I said. He thinks the common man is stupid. He thinks there can be no art in a democracy. Who do you like better? Who's more you? Neither of them are me. The, one of the great pleasures and triumphs of, of, of writing novels is, is not to be you. <laughs> it's, bad enough, it's bad enough the rest of your life to be you. What you should be pleased with about this book is that it's so different from your other books. And the, the, the terrible thing is to find ways in which, having been conceited enough to think that your books were different from each other, then to find that there are certain little patterns and ways in which you do repeat yourself inevitably. Well, I'll tell you, I think this is your best book. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you so much.